Yeah, thanks, uh, Susmita. So um, it's like really a privilege to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker today, Arindam Khan, who is a faculty member at IISC. Uh, so Arindam was my one year junior in Kharagpur, and I'm delighted to see his progress in uh, the wonderful work he has been doing over the years. So just to introduce Arindam, uh, Arindam did his PhD from Georgia Tech, and uh, he has been working in mainly in theoretical computer science, but his work spans multiple areas of theoretical computer science. So he has been working in approximation algorithm, combinatorial optimization, online learning, uh, online algorithms, and many and geometric algorithms, and many other areas. Okay, so his work, his wonderful work has already been recognized with uh, different awards and uh, things. So I will just mention a few because the list is so long. Uh, it's, uh, he got the best paper award. He and his co-authors got the best paper award in International Symposium on Mathematical Foundations of Computer Science. In 2020, his work has appeared in Highlights of Algorithms. 2021, he got Pratiksha Trust Young Investigator Award, Google Explore CSR Award, and more recently, the Google India Research Award. Today, Arindam will be talking about uh, his breakthrough result in uh, for, for approximating independent set in intersection graph of rectangles. So Arindam, we are really looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot to Urjitta for uh, such a kind introduction and thanks a lot to the uh, organizers for, the, for this in, uh, in, uh, invitation. Okay, so welcome everyone. So this talk is on approximation algorithms for maximum independent set of rectangles. And it's a joint work with uh, five people, Waldo Galvez from PU Munich, Madhusudan Reddy, who was an undergrad at that time, uh, third year undergrad from IIT Kharagpur, and now he has started in CMU as a PhD student. Matthew Mary from University of Warsaw, Poland, Tobias Momke from Germany and Andreas Wiese. He was in Chile that time, but now he has moved to Netherlands. So in this talk, uh, it, it's a two-hour talk. So first hour, today actually I'll focus on the background and uh, I'll talk about other problems also in this area. And maybe at the end, I'll start talking about technical details of our result. And tomorrow it will be more technical. And uh, please feel free to stop me at any point. I want to keep this as interactive as possible. So. If you have any question, please feel free to ask me, uh, stop me at any point and ask the question. So let's start. So we have, uh, the, as I said, the talk is on approximation algorithms for maximum independent set of rectangles. So first I'll talk about approximation algorithms, then rectangles, and then maximum independent set. So it might be, most of you already know about approximation, but for those of you who do not know, just to define, approximation algorithms are efficient algorithms that find near optimal solution. And it's a very classical idea in theoretical computer science. There are multiple textbooks. Uh, for example, this uh, Smoyesh and Williamson or Vazirani's textbook is there. And the talk that I will talk about, it mainly focuses on geom geometric approximation, which is an intersection of approximation algorithm and computational geometry. And for that, the textbook by Sariel Harpele and other resources are there. So an algorithm uh, for a minimum, so it's an optimization problem, can be minimization or maximization? The problem I will talk are mostly maximization, but in some related problems, I'll talk about minimization as well. So for a minimization problem, an algorithm A is alpha approximation. And this, this is called absolute approximation as well, because there is a notion of asymptotic, which will come later. If AI, which is the value of the solution uh, of algorithm on instance I is within alpha times opti, where opti is the value of the solution, optimal solution on instance I. And for maximization problem, I define an algorithm is alpha approximation. If opt i is less than or equal to alpha times ai for all input instances i. So there is a, uh, I mean, normally people measure the approximation ratio by the ratio of uh, opt i by ai or opt, opt i by ai. So uh, people try to make alpha. Uh, so in, in this talk, actually, I focus on alpha more than one, so the definition is slightly changed and that's why I kept this definition that opti for a maximization problem is anyway more than AI. So we want AI to be as close to opti, so I want it is less than equal to alpha times AI and alpha should be as close to one as possible. And as I mentioned, this is called absolute approximation. There is another notion of asymptotic approximation. For minimization problem, that talks about uh, the case when optimal solution is large. 
so this is the expression so let me uh, explain what is this saying so just first focus on the things in the, under this curly bracket this is saying okay we are looking at the ratio of ai and opti and the maximum ratio there given that opti is equal to n so given a particular value of opti i am looking at all instances for which we get this particular value of opti i am looking at the worst case ratio of ai by opti i and then i look at the lim sup when n tends to infinity so when n tends to infinity what is the approximation guarantee that we get So intuitively, that says that if I have alpha asymptotic approximation, then uh, let's say a i is less than equal to alpha times opt i plus some small o of opt. So think of constant. If this kind of things happen, we call the algorithm to be alpha asymptotic approximation. Okay. So any questions so far about definition? Because this is needed. The definition of approximation algorithm and so on. Or in the mid, like n tends to infinity, the value of opt tends to infinity here. Yeah. yeah. So when n n is not the number of items in this case, n is basically the value of optimal solution. So when opt tends to infinity, yeah, they are same. So opt i equal to n. So when optimal so, so optimal value tends to infinity, what is the approximation ratio that you get? That is called asymptotic. In the asymptotic setting, what is the approximation ratio? The reason it is considering the asymptotic setting is sometimes for some pathological instances you can have maybe opt equal to one or two. And then algorithm perform very bad. You need maybe two when opt equal to one, so you get ratio two. But maybe for large values, it, you also get opt plus one. So then the ratio is much better compared to factor two. Okay. Uh, now in this talk, I will talk a lot about petas, and there are several types of petas. So petas is polynomial time approximation scheme, and we call uh, for a problem we. we call the problem is admitting a petas if for any constant epsilon positive constant epsilon there exists a polynomial time algorithm a epsilon such that ai a epsilon i is less than equal to 1 plus epsilon opt i and the run time depends on epsilon so it it could be n to the power function of epsilon think of n to the power 1 by epsilon something so if epsilon is a constant then it is a polynomial time n to the power constant and this is saying that for any epsilon you can get this so you can get as arbitrary close to opt as possible but the run time will increase as you get more and more closer to opt so this is called petas now there is a variant called epetas or efficient polynomial time approximation scheme then it is petas but the run time is slightly better so now what you want you want the run time to be order of function of epsilon times n to the power c and here the exponent of uh, n the c it is independent of epsilon so Think of an example of runtime, something like one by epsilon to the power one by epsilon times n to the power hundred. That's a epetas kind of a runtime because the exponent is independent of epsilon. Then third one is called fully polynomial time approximation scheme or epetas, when the runtime is polynomial in both n and one by epsilon. So think of one by epsilon square n cube, something like this. So epetas, epetas, and epetas. and uh, there is complexity complexity theoretic relationship so if you if, if you know a problem is apx hard then it will not imply a petas if a problem is w1 hard assuming opt is the parameter then it implies no epetas and if a problem is strongly np hard it implies no epetas some more petas Uh, so one is called asymptotic polynomial time approximation scheme. So it is petas, but in the asymptotic setting. So as I mentioned, the asymptotic ratio or approximation ratio becomes one plus epsilon. So this extra part you can think of this as small of opt as well, but for now assume it's just constant. So it's a constant. So when opt is very large, opt tends to infinity. This constant is very small compared to opt. So you can ignore the constant, and the ratio you get is actually one plus epsilon. then there is something called quasi polynomial time approximation scheme or qpetas so here we get one plus epsilon approximation but the run time is quasi polynomial that is n to the power poly log n so n to the power log n or n to the power log n square something like that and finally there is something called pseudo polynomial time approximation scheme or ppetas so again a petas but not polynomial time run time but the run time is pseudo polynomial so it's Some n to the power constant, but n is 
um, the number of items and the numeric data that we have, it's polynomially bounded in n. So think of knapsack kind of problems. There's a numeric data, size of a knapsack or, or profit of a knapsack. That data, numeric data, it's polynomially bounded in n. So here I'm assuming n to be the number of input items and the input, basically something like input. So there's a question. So Qpeter's runtime, oh yes, yes. So Qpeter's also depends on epsilon. So I did not miss it. It is basically n to the power uh, log n to the power orders order one epsilon. So basically the constant that we have here, you can have it a function of epsilon. So for constant epsilon, it will become um, a constant. So Qpeter's also has dependency on the epsilon. And uh, the advantage of QPTAS is if you want to show some problem uh, admits PTAS, then uh, QPTAS kind of shows that it, it implies it's the problem is not APXR unless, unless some complex, complex theoretic assumption like NP is subset of uh, D time two to, the, 2 to the power poly log n. So we kind of believe that if a problem admits QPTAS, it should also have PTAS. So to show uh, kind of uh, it's not algorithmic, but kind of you believe if a problem admit, admits QPTAS, you should have, you should get a PTAS. So any questions so far regarding the definition of PTAS, QPTAS, etc. Okay. So now we'll talk about the second term rectangles. So I, I know everyone knows rectangle. And in fact, we love rectangles. So be it as financial K matter or- oh, I know. Uh, I know. Yes, yes. Can you just go back to the previous slide once? Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Ah, it implies it's not a PX hard. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, fine. Got it. So basically we expect it to have a PTAS. Yeah. If yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we love rectangles from money to let's say flag to cricket pitch, etc. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, even in art, people like rectangles a lot. So some example, modern art examples are like this. So this figure is, uh, its name is Suprematist Composition. This one is uh, Blackfire and they are, they are sold like $90 million or something, the price. So even in arts, people like rectangles a lot. So in fact, people sometimes, so when scientists look for uh, biomarkers or uh, existence of life in exoplanets, they normally look for this oxygen level because no normally oxygen is a highly reactive uh, element. And uh, if you if you have oxygen in a planet, then it, that means there is something which is producing oxygen. So there is some life there. But I'll say maybe rectangle is one of the biomarkers that we should look for because you will not find rectangle in nature, but for man-made structures, probably this is the most frequent, frequently occurring structure that we will see. So that's that's the reason like rectangles are so well studied even in mathematics and so on so if you look at uh, classical people in in discrete math and uh, and uh, theoretical computer science many of them have studied this kind of rectangles or packing problems so by packing problems i mean placement of objects non overlappingly under some constraints i will define more formally later but uh, like paul edos or ron graham uh, like edos started this area of uh, probabilistic method and uh, Graham was the first person to give approximation algorithm this uh, uh, scheduling problem and even modern degrades like Terence Tau, all of these people are looking at this kind of rectangle packing, square packing kind of problem. There are dedicated websites which talks about packing things. For example, there is a website called Eric's Packing Center. If you search, you will go to this website. And this is only five examples I, I, uh, I have here, but if you go to the website, there are, I think, 30 or 40 examples. So all types of permutation combination, triangles in squares, packing, rectangles in rectangles, squares in squares, squares in rectangles, and so on. So all these different types of variants you have and what is known for each of these cases, those things are there. So it's a very well-studied area. Um, so one, uh, so once I was uh, watching a video by Eric Dimen and he mentioned one thing that I think packing problems are appealing to mathematicians and computer scientists because they seem very simple and the simplicity and elegance is kind of attracting many people. So just you just need to need to place some items into container or some boxes and so on. 
but yet they tend to be extremely complicated to actually solve so the elegance is the problem definition but to, to solve them actually you need a lot of sophisticated tools so we are done with rectangles and now finally i will start with maximum independent set so independent set is a very classical problem and uh, independent set is a set of vertices in a graph such that no two vertices are adjacent so for example in this graph the star graph i can take either only the center vertex or the leaf vertices both are in independent sets similarly we can take this hypercube graph and there are many different independent so in case of maximum independent set or mis the goal is to find maximum sized independent set because you can have different size independent set and in this case this will be the maximum size independent set in the other graph either this size 4 or this size 4 there are this two um sets which correspond to maximum size independence so red vertices are the independent set in this figure and this is a classical nt hat problem and one can see it's easy, easy to get a trivial n approximation because you can take just a isolated vertex so n is number of vertices in the graph so if you take just one vertex it has no edges with any other vertices so that means it's independent set a single vertex and in the worst case you can have all it's a completely disconnected graph and there are n vertices so you can have n vertex in the maximum independent set so at least you are getting one so you get n approximation that is extremely trivial but it turns out that is okay and then you can slightly improve it further and you can get something like order uh, n by log cube n so this tilde notation is hiding some log log n factor but as you see it's uh, slightly better than n but not a lot of lot better and it turns out you cannot really do much better so there is a classical result by hasta which showed its np had to get even n to the power 1 minus epsilon approximation even n to the power 0.9999 is not possible if you assume np is not subset of zpp and there is slight improvement here uh, in the hardness but still i mean you, you, you see it's still uh, yeah you are no nowhere close to uh, getting a good approximation factor or so that's the present status for general maximum independent set problem but we'll look at special graph classes for which this is easier to solve so any question till till now yeah i said please please stop me at any point of time because we have one hour time today i need it to be interactive and yeah you can ask question any time okay so now we'll talk about this geometric intersection graph it's a special type of graph and here the nodes are corresponding to some geometric objects so you can think of polygon spheres disk rectangle etc and if two objects overlap then there is an edge between them so think of a setting it is a office space it's an example i'm giving in let's say covid situation we have so in this office cubicles if someone sits there is a radius of maybe 5 meters or 3 meters within which you don't want to enter because then there is a chance of contamination so each of this um chairs or or cubicles they are defining some kind of a disk region and maybe it, it can have different disk size depending on the the proximity to window or ac etc and then you can define this as an intersection graph so objects are now disks and if two disks intersect you create an edge between them. So the graph will look like this. For example, these two disks they are intersecting, so I create an edge between them. There are nodes corresponding to these two vertices. Similarly, uh, for this I create one node, and these two are intersecting, so I create an edge between them. So that's the way we create the graph. So it has both geometric interpretation as well as a graphical interpretation. and the goal is to find the maximum independent set in this geometric intersection graph so from graph theoretic point of view if you look at the graph this is an independent set because none of the vertices are sharing any edge okay this red vertices are defining an independent set and in terms of geometric view point this is saying that the objects are non overlapped so there is a graphical view point from independent set and for from geometric view point it says that objects are non overlapping yeah so this area actually is quite popular so i was just uh, few days back i was just looking at dvlp and i found in india 
last 10 years probably there are 50 researchers who have published at least one paper related to this area geometric integration graph so either in geometry or approximation or structural graph theory and so on so it's a very popular object at least in india so recent trends of algorithms uh, in india at least uh, it has been a recent trend to work on this area so before going to complicated object i will start with a simple object of intervals so think of the case when the nodes are corresponding to intervals so there is an edge between two intervals if they are overlapping and the goal is to find maximum independent set in this graph and geometric viewpoint is finding the maximum cardinality non overlapping intervals now this is uh, so in this for example in this example uh, these are the intervals so i drew it like a two dimensional thing but actually just to show the uh, intervals the first interval is between 0 to 3 second is between 1 to 4 and so on and i can create nodes corresponding to each of this so maybe this is the first one and second one so i can create first node and second node and if they are intersecting here in this region so there is an edge between them that's the way we create the graph now this problem is solvable in polynomial time so anyone remembers from undergrad algorithms how do you solve these problems for solve this problem the algorithm yeah so greedy so greedy says earliest finish time so basically what you do you start from the left and the first job that finishes, you take it and then remove all the other jobs that's overlapping with this job. Then again, you continue and the second job that finishes, you take it. And then again, you delete all, all the other intersecting job and then you continue the third job that finishes, you take it and you delete the rest and continue. And then that will give you the set of intervals. And in this graph, you can see these three nodes are corresponding to the set of intervals. So greedy works in the unweighted case. Now, if we go to the weighted case, you can show the greedy does not work. Um, you can probably take maybe a very high weight for this particular job that you removed and very smaller weight for this one. And then if you remove this job, you're already gone. But, so greedy will not work, but dynamic program works. So weighted case, how do you solve using dynamic program? So think of again, the case when we have these intervals and the, now they have weights, three, three, five and so on. And how do you solve it? So here the DP idea works on divide and conquer. So there are two types of DP, but I will focus on the DP based on divide and conquer. So what we'll do is we'll, we can look at all these points and then uh, I can cut, I mean, I can divide this region into two regions, left and right. So whatever interval is cutting this straight line, I delete it. And the remaining portion I solve recursively, the left part and right part. So I can have many positions to consider. Maybe this one is one position. The second one could be another position. Third one could be another position. And in this case, actually, I will delete both this and this because both are cut and so on. So what DP does is it tries out all possible such cuts. Now, how many possible cutting points are interesting? So it's only interesting to consider the, the left end point and right end point of this intervals. So there are n intervals. So there are two n number of n points. You can actually only consider these two n possible cuts and then look at the DP table for the left uh, solution for the left portion and solution for the right portion and then patch and select the best solution among all of us. And that will already give you the optimal solution. So just think for two minutes, maybe later, and you'll find out why this DP works. So our algorithm, finally, the rectangle algorithm will be a generalization of this idea only. So I will again try to find some cuts and solve this problems recursively, the smaller problems recursively. Okay. Any question regarding this part? Okay. So now, uh, oh, in the, uh, just to get some more intuition. So when you, so essentially you are guessing the cut, right? right. I mean, you cannot just cut at the middle because that might be the wrong cut. Uh, so you are trying to guess the correct cut such that you can do the patching. That's what your DP will figure out, right? Yes. So the, the, the point is, a guessing is not a difficult job because there are only two n number of cuts that. Yeah. Are yeah. So you right. just try yeah. out all possible cuts, and DP table will still have polynomial size. Uh, right. But each level has n choices, right? Uh. Okay. So how do you, let me write the DP then? So let's say dp x1 x2 it can it contains the optimal solution the range x1 comma x2 so I, let's say starting position was n and ending position is 2n so i want to compute dp of 
one comma two n. That is the final thing I want. And what I do is I look at the maximum over all i, and then I look at the solution of dp of one comma x plus dp of x comma two n. Okay. Not or not? Oh, it's i basically. Uh, one comma i and one comma. So i is basically going from one to two n. Yeah. And then uh, I look into it, and uh, I, when I look at this line i, I delete all this. Uh, I remove all the intervals that are intersecting this i th cut, and then I just look into the DP table, and you can construct it bottom up. DP table. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thanks. So now we go to slightly complicated objects when you have squares. It's again quite simple. Actually, a simple greedy algorithm will give you four approximations. So normally it's a homework in approximation algorithm or computational geometry course. And the algorithm is as follows that you sort the squares according to their sizes, and then select the smallest square, and then remove all the squares intersecting it and continue. And that already gives you a four approximation. And you can you can explain it in terms of uh, relating. Something called piercing number with independence number, and then you can chart the corners of the rectangles for each of these uh, uh, points in the each of the square in optimal solution. Uh, and this idea of squares can also be extended to other objects like discs and fat objects. By fat object, I mean object something something like this. Like it's a convex object, and if I look at the smallest, largest disc inscribing this object, and smallest disc. Circumscribing the object, this ratio is constant. That's why it's kind of fat. So if I have an object like this, it is not fat because the ratio is really large, small, and large. Whereas a fat object will have square or disc or uh, things which are, which looks kind of not too thin. They are called fat objects. So this most of these approaches actually extend to fat objects. And the reason maximum independence had become an imp important problem because it, it developed a lot of techniques for these problems, and those those were useful for many other problems. For example, uh, first Hodgbaum and Mas gave pitas for unit squares using a technique called shifted grid, which has been very useful in many problems. Then for arbitrary squares, even with weights, there are the techniques called uh, shifted hierarchical decomposition, which gave pitas, and then Chan Timothy Chan also gave poor tree based algorithm, which um, Which gave pitas, and then there is there are geometric separator theorem similar to planar separator theorem, which again gave pitas for arbitrary squares. One can use local search algorithm for arbitrary squares and so on. So a lot of techniques developed uh, around this area, and it was useful for many other problems as well: geometric set cover, geometric heating set, and so on. So now we'll talk about rectangle. So one thing is for rectangle. Many of these techniques don't ex extend because rectangle is not a fat object. It can be very skewed. The ratio between the width and height can be arbitrarily bad. So things like um, shifted grid or hierarchical decomposition or local search don't work, as we know, for rectangles. So we'll see only there are two main techniques which will work for rectangles. One is linear program. Other one is dynamic program or separated theorem based dynamic program. So those of you who joined late, you can actually start from here. I will again define the problem that we are studying. So we are studying maximum independence of rectangles problem, and in short, I will call it MISR. And in this case, we are given a set of n axis parallel input rectangles. We are assuming axis parallel rectangles. There is one question: Do all of these works deal with squares or rectangles in one or two dimension? No. I mean, this most of these works that I talked about for squares. They can be extended to d-dimensional hypercubes as well. So, if it is d-dimensional fat objects, it it also extends. So, think of cubes or yeah, four-dimensional objects and other things are not really practical, but they have some application in database and so on. So, yeah, they still work in those kind of objects. Yeah, so a set of n axis parallel input rectangles. We are assuming axis parallel property here, and the goal is to find a, max, a set of non-overlapping rectangles of minimum uh, maximum coordinate. So in this example, I have five jobs, five uh, rectangles, and I can create five or six, maybe six six rectangles, and 
I can create corresponding graph as well. And the goal is to find independence in the graph or the maximum set of non-overlapping rectangle for rectangle. And this has many applications. For example, in, in map labeling, data mining, resource allocation. So think of a think of a problem where this one dimension is like bandwidth, and other dimension is time duration. So now these job requests are asking for some amount of bandwidth for some some time duration. So it's basically rectangles that you are getting, and your goal is to allocate this allocate maximum number of such rectangles. So okay, practical motivation is there, but as it's a talk in theory CS, why it's an important problem in theory CS? One of the reason it's important because it has lot of connections with other problems. But any questions so far about the problem? Of So theoretical important ways. So there are this class of problems which I call bin packing type, and other one is knapsack type. And I, and we are looking at packing problems. So our goal is to find some axis aligned non-overlapping placement. For now, as we only were talking about rectangles. And depending on the rectangles movement, you can define different different problems. So in some problems, you can take a rectangle like this, and maybe you can move it anywhere, like vertically or horizontally. So that will uh, we'll see bin packing and knapsack are those kind of problems. In some problems, we'll only move vertically but not horizontally, and sometimes we'll not allow any movement. So one question: Can axis parallel constraint be waived? So I will talk about this later, but it seems it's very hard. So for example, uh, if you just take line segments, one can. So I will talk about this later, but uh, into it's quite hard. For example, if you just take line segments, what we know is is a simple two approximation algorithm. Uh, if you have axis parallel line segments, but uh, which is a special case of axis parallel rectangles. Uh, but if you even take arbitrary line segment with any or orientation, then the based on approximation is n to the power epsilon. So from two, you go to n to the power epsilon. Even a poly n is not known. Uh, not, uh, even a poly log n is not known. So the reason is if you have this arbitrary orientation, if you don't have the axis parallel property. Then you can have much more complicated interaction between the objects, which is difficult to handle. So that's why uh, people focus on axis parallel. So many of these can be extended to the setting where instead of only two orientations, so in axis parallel you have kind of two orientation basically. So the largest side of a rectangle is either vertical or horizontal. You can still extend to constant types of orientation, but extending it to uh, arbitrary types of orientation is is hard. It's difficult. Another reason people study axis parallel setting is because of the practical importance. For example, the problem, the motivation of MISR came from this bandwidth allocation kind of problem, and there it's exactly axis parallel. There are two resources, and basically uh, the width is telling how much amount of resources it requires in one dimension, and the height is telling how much of the resources it requires in the other dimension. So that's why axis parallel is very well studied, and also in practice, many of these problems are. Coming from cutting problems as well, where you have some objects and you have to cut through machines, and uh, in practical industry, people have this axis parallel cutting mechanism uh, because it's easy to implement. So that's the reason axis parallel problems are more well studied. Uh, and also, if we don't have this constraint, it's very difficult. That's a so at the end of the talk, I'll talk about the open problem. If we don't have this constraint, can we get even a poly log n approximation, log n to the one thousand or billion? If it's possible, but for rectangles, we'll show you can have much better ratio. You will have actually a two plus epsilon approximation when you have axis parallel rectangles. Okay. So now let me talk about this slide and different problems which with which MISR has connection. So in bin packing type problem, we have some rectangles. So in both these problems, we have some rectangles and we have to pack them. And by packing, I mean It's a axis aligned non-overlapping placement. In bin packing problem, the goal is to pack all rectangles into minimum number of square bins. In knapsack problems, we have we, the goal is to pack maximum profit subset of rectangles into one unit square knapsack. So it's just like knapsack and bin packing classical problems, but instead of just unit bin, now we have we have unit square bin. Now, if you think of the case of two-dimensional bin packing, then you have some rectangles. 
you want to pack them into unit square bins but you can place rectangles anywhere you want you can move it vertically or horizontally and uh, in this case the base tone approximation is 1.405 and we know the problem does not admit any any apta asymptotic polynomial time approximation for two dimensional knapsack the base tone approximation it's again similar but you want to pack a subset of uh, rectangles you can move it anywhere and pack it into into the knapsack the base tone approximation is 1.89 and we expect the apta's in this case um but yeah so this is the two problems we have and you can think of I mean, this is a basically generalization generalization of bin packing and knapsack if you think of all rectangles have same height exactly height equal to 1 then this is just re re this reduces to one dimensional bin packing or one dimensional knapsack then the other condition problem says that okay now the rectangles are fixed their horizontal locations are fixed but you can move them vertically and then it's called unsplitable flow problem or storage allocation problem or round sap problem round ufp problem so the problem is as follows so let me talk about storage allocation or unsplitable flow problem so it's a graph problem again you have some path okay. it's not appearing for some reason and then uh, you have some jobs and so this paths are saying okay maybe some time intervals and which job is from what time to what time we are given some jobs and there is some profile some capacity profile so you want to schedule these jobs under this capacity profile such that i mean in that case you, you actually you can place the jobs you can place it here or here or here it's fine so you can move it vertically but the horizontal position is fixed you cannot really move it and the goal is to find a maximum profit subset of jobs which you can fit like this so it's a problem known as a uh, storage allocation problem and in unsplitable flow problem it is similar but you can also slice the rectangles and you can so th there the goal is to if you look at one particular edge total amount of resource requirement by all the jobs placed in that edge should be at most the capacity of that edge and this is again a very classical problem i mean in ufp alone i think there are more than 20 35 papers in chalk box soda and very recently this year only uh, there is a peters for this problem Uh, and for storage allocation problem of sap there is a 1.69 so there is two variants one is called uniform where the capacity profile is uniform throughout the edges so it's basically rectangle type of object but in the other case you can have general profile arbitrarily shaped profile on top so for sap the best known result for general profile is 2 plus epsilon and for uniform capacity 1.69 is the 96 is the best known and then there is a similar variant called round sap or round ufp where you want to find this kind of ufp packing of all jobs but into minimum number of bins and bins is, are this capacity profiles and for this uh, there is a 2 plus epsilon approximation known and there is a order log log an approximation known for the general profile and if you look at misr it is again a special case of this kind of problems where the rectangles are not allowed to be moved so they are fixed and now you want to find minimum number of uh, bins where you can pack all the rectangles without any overlap so that is rectangle coloring problem in other words you want to color the rectangle into minimum number of classes such that each color class uh, are disjoint and in the mwis or weighted version of mis sir the goal is to find maximum profit subset of uh, rectangles into one knapsack such that none of them are overlapping so in this packing the rectangles are fixed so you cannot move them and it turns out the technique for one problem uh, is kind of transferable to other problems uh, in in this area for example the log log an approximation for mwisr those kind of approaches have been used in the algorithm for round ufp or round sap similarly for even ufp uh, peters algorithm before that there are some other work which also use some special class of misr instances to obtain improved approximation for ufp uh even for two dimensional knapsack or two dimensional strip packing other packing problems there is a technique for misr which is called corridor decomposition which was used to give improved approximation for this problems and in turn these two two dimensional knapsack algorithms were used to give better algorithms for two dimensional bin packing and so on so there is a connection between all these problems and that made this misr problem to be very important so it has connection with many problems two dimensional bin packing knapsack strip packing ufp sap round ufp round sap 
rectangle coloring geometric set cover geometric heating set for example uh, the some geometric separator based approach for misr was used to give improved approximation for geometric set cover problem for some particular objects so that's one of the reasons misr was so important the techniques developed for misr was useful for many other problems and also it has deep connections with other areas like structural graph theory or discrete or commutative geometry so we'll i'll talk about this later not today but um, there is something called chromatic number and clique number of chi bounded graphs so chi bounded graph means uh, this ratio of chromatic number and clique and clique number are bounded and uh, one can show that there is a linear there is a linear program for misr whatever integral the gap of the linear program is that gives you a bound on this chromatic number and clique number ratio so uh, that that gives you some structured pro properties for this uh, structural graph theory similarly we'll come across this park tardos conjecture which is not dealing with really uh, algorithms but it's more a commutative question and it has connections so if you solve park tardos conjecture it, it will imply an approximation algorithm for misr and so on so that's the reason misr is theoretically so important so any question regarding this problems or Am I sir till now? Okay. So now <clears throat> let's talk about am I sir results. Oh, it's already almost forty-five minutes. I guess. So. the work of khanna uh, i mean there are multiple algorithms log n algorithms known for the problem 3 4 algorithms and then uh, actually there was in, improvement and people showed you can actually get as close to log n as possible i mean this uh, constant before log n can be made as, as small as possible then if you have q to be the click size then one can show 4q you can get an approximation of 4q uh then mark showed that even for squares the problem is w1 hard so we don't expect the epitas for this problem and then chalmsuk and chuhai showed a order log log an algorithm using linear program and we'll see this linear program later maybe tomorrow and then uh, aramasing we say showed that this problem admits a cupitas in n to the power poly log n by epsilon psi there was further improvement by chuhai and ne and uh, it was shown that you can actually get even better than cupita you can get poly log log n time algorithm n to the power poly log log n time one for itself approximation so people expect it should have a pita so because we have a cupita for the problem but till recently log log n was the best known algorithm even a constant was not known so recent breakthrough by michel first gave a 10 approximation and it was is a very surprising result and the analysis was based on a lot of case analysis so total 60 cases were there with some example of the cases and it turns out yeah somehow it started with each of the cases and it it worked out it worked out it worked out so it was like a thriller but finally all 60 cases were fine and you can get get it done so the question was can we get improved approximation better run time and a simpler analysis which does not go via so many case analysis so what we showed uh, is a polynomial time 2 plus epsilon approximation so earlier there was a three approximation which was published in soda this year but then there was improvement subsequently which was 2 plus epsilon approximation and the high level idea is what we do is we show existence of a good structured solution now in case of misr for example the, the candidate solution the candidate independent set solutions can be huge you can have exponential number of possible solution all subsets of n items could be possible candidate so that's exponential so that's hard to deal with so what we need is we want to get some kind of structured solution which is small in size maybe n square or n cube or some polynomial in size and this structured solution i can use as a good approximation of the of the candidate solution space c so if i take any independent set in this set of candidate solution then i can get a structured solution which is a subset of this independent set but it is close enough it's within alpha factor so if i have this property then what we'll do is we'll we can 
we'll write a DP which finds the best structure solution. And structure solution there are only polynomial number of uh, candidates. So it can find the best structure solution. And then best structure solution is an alpha approximation of the candidate solution. So I'll get a good approximation of the original independent set. So the difficulty, technical, so I'll show the DP based algorithm, but it's quite simple. It's just extension of the previous DP based algorithm that we talked about in the interval case. But uh, that's, that's quite simple. But the main difficulty is showing that, okay, how can you ensure uh, you'll get a good structure solution? How do you prove that there is a good structure solution and how do you find it? So even this good approx uh, structure solution, existence of this may not be algorithmic. You can just show it existentially. There exists some solution because the DP will find it algorithmic. And uh, it's also interesting because it's kind of tight what you are getting this two plus epsilon because even for line segments the best known result is two approximation only so think of axis parallel line segments and they're overlapping so it's basically interval kind of setting but now instead of only one direction you can have both di directions so what you can do how do you get a simple two approximation you just take either vertical uh, intervals or you take only horizontal intervals and then run the previous DP, for example, uh, then or even the greedy algorithm in an un unweighted setting that that will already give you an optimal solution. And then you return the base of this two. And that is giving you a two approximation. So even for axis, par uh, axis parallel line segment, that is the best one, factor two. And rectangle is much more complicated because much more complicated intersections can come in rectangles. And there we are getting two plus itself. So I believe to get beyond this, we need significantly new techniques. Now. So now I will go to the technical details, but it's a maybe how much time do I have? Five minutes, 10 minutes or? No, I think you have uh, more than 10 minutes. It started at like uh, five minutes past 10. Okay, so around 11, five. 11, five for sure. Okay. So there's a question. Can you explain step one again? Yeah. So, so it's an NP hard problem. The difficulty is because there are exponential number of possible candidate solutions. If you have n rectangles, possible number of candidate solution independent set could be any subset of this n elements. That's kind of exponential in nature. And if you want to go through all these solutions, that's too, too bad. You cannot do that. So what we want is instead of so many candidate solutions, can we get a small sized, polynomial sized set of solution? Yes which is a good approximation. That means, let's say I have, uh, yeah, this S has polynomial number of candidate solution, let's say n to the power thousand or something. So if I have some independent solution, which looks like this, okay, this is not independent actually. So maybe it looks like this. Maybe I can have a, a, a solution present in S, which is very similar to this. Maybe I don't have this one, but I still have this two. So it's a good approximation, a subset of I and it's within alpha factor. So maybe if I was three in this case, I prime is two. So within two by three factor. So if I ensure S to have this property that for any candidate solution, I can have a structured solution in S, which is close to the value of the independent set, then I'm, I'm done because there's a, I, I can show there's a dynamic program which can find the best structured solution in S. And in intuitively that's happening because the size of S is small. It's in polynomial, uh, it's, it's polynomial size. So DP intuitively can search over all these polynomial candidates in S and find the best solution. And that will give you the best structured solution. And I, as, I, as we know that uh, if I take the optimal solution, that's also, uh, there is a structure solution with an alpha factor of that. And we are returning the best structured solution. So at least it's better than that as well. So we are getting alpha approximation for the optimal solution. Okay. okay, so now I have 10 minutes. I will not go over the technical part in detail. Maybe I will talk about guillotine cuts, one object, and tomorrow I will talk more about the algorithm for Emmanuel. So. so I talked about the structured solution, but what do I mean by structured solution? So let me give one example, and that will motivate the next step. So the structured solution we'll talk about is called guillotine cuts. 
Now, guillotine cuts, uh, it's an end-to-end -end cut along a straight line, which divides a rectangular piece into two smaller pieces. So, when I talk about guillotine cuts, now it is not an MISA city. It's an independent problem I'm talking about. And um, now we have some non-overlapping rectangles, which are inscribed on some piece. And uh, I want to separate them using this kind of guillotine cuts, which are end-to-end -end cuts along a straight line. And it's practically very relevant and uh, in cutting stock kind of problem this is studied. So you, can, you want to cut out some required geometric objects from some large source material like glass, rubber, metal, or cloth. So you think of these rectangular objects as some kind of pattern that you need for, for your purpose, but uh, you want to cut them. And the cutting machines only can cut straight line way. You cannot really bend because bending uh, is problematic in many of these cutting problems. And it's also easy to program this kind of guillotine. So there is column generation technique, which is used in, in programming. So this guillotine cuts were studied from 1970s by Gilmore Gomodi in the context of cutting stock. And uh, because of it, it has lower cost in, in this cutting industry and simple usability. Now, what is guillotine cut? Um, so we want this end-to-end -end cut and we want a series of guillotine cuts and each cut will separate a sub piece into two new sub piece. Like in this case, the original piece was P and this new this cut is dividing into two regions, P1 and P2. And then once you have this regions, this P2, I can again cut it like this, an end-to-end -end cut, another guillotine cut. And then I can have another guillotine cut here, which cuts P1 and continue. Now note that after I cut these objects, then they're independent, these two, two pieces. And I can cut them again differently. So the second level, the first level cut was this. The second level cuts may not be next to each other. I may not be continuous. I mean, one can be here, other can be here. It may not be like this. So I just want end to end on the smaller sub piece, not the entire piece. And it has connection with other packing problems. So, for example, bin packing, knapsack, strip packing. These are all studied in the skeleton constraints and uh, for bin packing there is a AP task, for 2D knapsack there is a PP task, for 2D strip packing there is also a PP task and there is a tight uh, absolute approximation guarantee. Okay. So this cutting sequence you can think of as a binary where each node corresponds to some rectangular region and each non-leaf node contains two children which are obtained by this cut. So think of this previous uh, pattern. So uh, this was the initial object and I cut like this. So I get two smaller sub pieces. Then again, I cut like this. I get two smaller sub pieces and continue. And at the end, the leaf contains only one rectangle in part piece. So then we call the, the, this leaf pieces are separable. I can cut out this leaf pieces. Now, we call a rectangle is extracted if it is not killed or crossed by uh, any of the uh, cuts and at the end, it is the only rectangle in its sub -piece. So, in this example, when I have this cut, I kill this rectangle to R2 because it's passing through R2. I cannot really separate out R2. And then I have the sequence, maybe I cut like this and this and then this, this. And then if you see all these rectangles are in one, uh, are the only rectangle in its sub -piece. So all rectangles except R2 are extracted by this guillotine cutting sequence. So given configuration is guillotine separable, if all rectangles can be extracted using some cutting sequence. So this example I said, it's only showing one particular cutting sequence. It's not showing that it is not possible to do for any cutting sequence, but one can prove formally there are instances like this for which you cannot separate out all rectangles using a sequence of guillotine cuts. So for example, if you have this four pinwheel kind of a structure, whatever way, way you cut end to end, it has to cross one of the rectangles. You cannot extract four rectangles. At most, you can extract three rectangles. So then the question is, can we separate out at least a constant fraction of rectangles? So if you have n rectangles, can we get, let's say, n to the power n by 10 or n by 15? And it seems, uh, yeah, it should be. And there's a conjecture by Park and Tardos, almost 22 years old, which they conjecture to be true. And it remained a big open question in this area because it has connection with other problems as well. We'll see the connection of this problem with MISR as well. So what is known for now is 
in this kind of a instance where it's basically coming from the previous instance only but it's more square like objects if you are given n rectangles then in this instance you can show that you cannot separate out more than n by 2 rectangles using a sequence of guillotin cuts so there is a factor 2 loss that will happen on the other hand the best known algorithm or even existential result shows that you can always separate out n by log n plus 1 Actually, it's order log, and I can say a slight improvement is there. Rectangles using a sequence of guillotine cuts. So there's a huge gap. I mean, the conjecture is it's a constant. In fact, two is the conjecture that you can always separate out n by two rectangles, but we have n by log n. So two and log n. There are this huge gap, but nothing is known. So let me. Okay, how much time do I have? Maybe a three four minutes. I'll just briefly tell you the proof of n n log n. Plus one, and then tomorrow we can resume. So one observation you have is uh, if all rectangles intersect a straight line, then they are guillotine separable. So this red line it is crossing all the rectangles, and then I can separate out all the rectangles by the second stage of guillotine cuts like this. You can also extend it to say that okay, if all rectangles intersect a T like this, so T can be like this or this or even this, depending on the arms are uh, are zero or not. So, if they intersect all the uh, all rectangles intersect some t, then they are also guillotine separable. And using this property, we can have log n plus one. There is a question: either aim to find the location of independent set of rectangles and then separate out, then we can use uh, trapezoidal map. Yeah, actually, the locations are easy to find. There are only two n locations. I mean, I will show, but uh, I mean, you you have n rectangles, so independent sets. Uh, you can stretch things, and the only interesting uh regions where which are interesting are basically the the corner points other points are not so interesting and there are only four in square corner points so it is not the location of independent rectangles but exactly find out what are the rectangles that is the problem so location is fine the dp will find the all the possible location and then find it out but then uh, the point is uh, what is the best independent set that we don't know. Okay, so yeah, so the we can assume the rectangles are embedded in some two n cross two n grid with integral corners, because I can always uh, consider the endpoints of the rectangles, and there are two n rectangles, two n endpoints uh, on each of the dimensions, and then just make this non-uniform grid to a uniform grid. So then, what I'll do is I'll create. So do I have two more minutes, or Jinta, or? So then, what I do is I create this log n number of levels. So what I start with is uh, this zero, this is two n. So at level, uh, I look at the uh, this width n and I create this red pole, and then I look at n by two and three n by two, and I create this green pole and continue. So there are total log of two n or log n plus one levels, and that will decompose this plane. And what I define is uh, for a rectangle, the smallest level. Which is intersect, intersecting the rectangle. I define it to be the pole. So in this case, red um, rectangles are the uh, level one rectangles because it's intersecting this, this red line. Then the green one uh, is level two. So the red one is already intersecting le level one. So it is getting already level one. So though it is intersecting level two as well, I will assign it to the smallest level. So this way, I can partition this n rectangles into log n number of color classes. And then I claim each of these color classes are guillotine separable. So think of uh, some color class like gray. So what I can do is I can take all the previous levels and let's say they are red and green levels. They are partitioning the rectangles into uh, several regions. And then if I look at any of the uh, in, in, inner regions, then this is these rectangles are intersecting a single line. So I already proved if all rectangles intersect single line, I can separate them using guillotine cuts. So Each of these color classes can be separated by guillotine cut, and that is giving you uh, a separation of n by log n plus one. And uh, what one can show, you can slightly improve it to something like log n plus two base three using the property of t cuts. Then the question was, can we improve this further if we use more complicated guillotine cuts? And we showed it's not true. But I mean, till now we talked about guillotine cuts and showed this result. Now what turns out? 
there is a connection between this gilding cut objects and MISR. And maybe today I don't have time to go over this. So we can show that whatever, if you show that given in non-overlapping rectangle, I can always separate out n by alpha fraction of the rectangles by gilding cuts. Then that will imply an alpha approximation for MISR. That is the connection. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It will take five minutes to explain this, I guess. So maybe it's better to stop today or yeah, maybe yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's better yeah. we do it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Arindu, for the very nice talk. So any questions? So just to relate to the deep, P approach, the divide and conquer DP approach you talked about for the interval thing, right? So this uh, this cut, they are they were also kind of the guillotine cuts, right? I mean, it, 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 yeah. So okay, so that's the intuition that you will. So yeah. I mean, there you don't even need cuts; you need points. Basically, points. Sure. Are, now you have you guillotine cuts with yeah. extension. Now okay. we'll see that. Okay, I mean, the conjecture is also equal to two, so we should get a two approximation. If we prove this conjecture, sure. the hardness is in the in the analysis. How do you prove this? So okay. it seems that if we have the guillotine cuts, we don't have too much power. So what in the next lecture, what we'll sh I'll show is you can have bends here. Instead of one guillotine cut, now you can have more and more bends. And the bends can avoid cutting more rectangles. And finally, we'll use that property to show this two plus epsilon approximation. So there are two questions. Uh, one is do horizontal cuts are always vertical or horizontal lines or bends possible? So yeah, by definition, guillotine cuts are end-to-end -end horizontal or vertical cut and they're axis parallel, but you can also have non-axis parallel cuts as well in guillotine cuts, but in axis parallel rectangles, actually those will not help. You can show that for axis parallel rectangles, whatever you can do with axis parallel guillotine cuts, you can do with arbitrary guillotine cuts as well. But bends also will do in, in the next part instead of cutting like one straight line, we can have some uh, axis aligned set of line segment like this, which will have the cut. So like instead of this kind of guillotine cut, we'll have bends and that will help us later. And uh, does it help if all the rectangles and squares are of the same dimension? So what do we mean by dimension? Uh, you are saying the ratios of width and height are similar? So, so as a length, lengths are same. Yeah, then actually all of them are of length one. Okay. All are of yeah, I mean actually both the cases can be solved. There are two cases. One is when so for square case, actually, we have proved this conjecture. So for squares, we showed around 60 or something. I forgot the exact ratio, but some constant. Uh, this conjecture is true. So given embedding of n non-overlapping squares, you can always find n by let's say 81 fraction of squares, which are separate separable by guillotine cuts. For squares, it is true. Uh, but for rectangles also, if you have same dimensions, so if the ratio of width and height is similar for all rectangles, then what you can do is you can stretch things and make them square-like objects. So instead of square, I can I can say if the width by height ratio is constant, uh, they're like fat objects. So they can also be handled by this approach. Or if all the rectangles have same uh, width or same length or almost same width or same length, that also can be handled. Those are special cases which can be handled. But in general rectangles, you can have arbitrary ratios, which creates a problem. Okay, any more questions? There's another question. Okay, why cannot we use arbitrary square algorithm for arbitrary line segments to get figures? I guess we can translate a line segment in a square. Uh, so for arbitrary line segments, uh, you mean uh, even for axis parallel, let's say arbitrary is much more harder. You have any orientation, but if you, even if you take, let's say axis parallel line segments, then the square algorithm will not work. So what square algorithm you want to use? Let's say you want to use greedy algorithm or uh, so if you remember, okay, can you tell me which square algorithm you want to use like greedy or shifted grid or quadri, which one? Because each of these has different problems. So if you have there's a shifted grid or quartry kind of algorithm. What it does is it, it divides, it's either divide and conquer policy, but then it, it creates some kind of smaller cells and it uses the property that if you have squares, uh, then in this, in this uh, 
smaller cells you can have only constant number of squares and that you can solve in brute force way but if you have arbitrary line segment you can have arbitrary mini line segment within the cells so it will not extend to that case so there are several technical difficulties if you want to extend the square algorithm even to arbitrary line uh, even to axis parallel line segment because it's not general the so square is not a generalization of axis parallel line segment it's a different case the volumetric argument won't work yes. volume argument won't work to just say that yeah volume exactly the volume argument will not work so for fat objects we know that it has large volume and that that helps in this smaller grid cells which does not work here so okay then so uh, uh, so we uh, uh, end the session here uh, thank you arindam uh, for this wonderful talk we will be forward to your next talk tomorrow and uh, Thank you everyone for attending this.